the possibility of life on other worlds is something that's obviously captured human imagination for many years. And recently with the discovery of exoplanets, the push to find life on other worlds in our solar system and beyond has greatly increased. But with there being so many possible signs of life across so many disciplines, how can we easily make it so that a scientist with expertise in one field knows what to look for? And how can we condense such a diverse interdisciplinary span of knowledge into one place? So the answer is the Life Detection Knowledge Base, which is an online database of biosignatures that's created by the NASA Center for Life Detection. Um, so my name is Adriana Gomez Buckley, and today I will be walking you through my experience writing an entry for sulfur mineralogy uh, for the knowledge base of this past summer under the amazing mentorship of my two mentors listed here, uh, Dr. Andrew Rios and Dr. Svetlana Shkoyar. All right, so the Life Detection Knowledge Base, or LDKB, is an online community resource designed to compile knowledge and also support discussion about potential signs of life and their detectability. So the way that the knowledge base is structured, uh, information is presented in pro and con arguments that either support or contradict a given biosignature. And each of these is accompanied by at least one piece of evidence sourced from published literature. So this is actually a very important aspect of the LDKB because you can't post an argument without associated evidence, which just helps make sure that any argument that's posted is supported by at least one professionally reviewed and vetted publication. And to ensure coherence and consistency, all entries here are structured according to the same criteria and categories. So if we go ahead and jump in, um, when you first enter the LDKB, there's three main categories, uh, chemistry, structure, and activity. So to give some really brief examples, um, chemistry would include things like chemical properties or isotope ratio patterns. Structure has to do with observable visual characteristics, so say the shape or form of a crystal feature. And then activity has to do with processes like growth, reproduction, and catalysis. So we'll look at what happens if we expand one section. So if I were to go into chemistry, we see the categories, and now underneath there is a full range of topics. And underneath each of these, we have individual features and biosignatures, um, which make up the entries in the LDKB. And going another level deeper, when we view an individual feature or biosignature, a complete entry is going to look something like this. So you have a background section that gives context for what this feature is, and then you have several criteria under which the arguments are nested. So these criteria refer to prevalence, which is how likely a feature is to be produced by a certain source, and then feature strength, um, which is kind of survivability, prominence, abundance, et cetera. And then these are in either biological or abiotic context. And then one final level in, this is an example of what pro and con arguments look like. So you'll notice that each of them has at least one piece of evidence. And all of these have um, links to the paper's abstract and to the actual paper if you'd like to read it. And another feature I want to point out here is actually the comment section, which is one of the most important features of the LDKB. So let's say that you add in a pro argument due to supporting evidence that you have at the time. But then what happens if later someone comes through and says, hey, a new study has been done and this argument isn't entirely accurate anymore, or maybe they know of a new study that's been done that should also be added as evidence. Well, that's where they can leave a comment, which allows for some great discussion about the validity of arguments or maybe if concerns are brought up. And it just makes sure that the LDKB is really kept up to date as new studies are published. So while only curators and administrators have permissions to add or edit this entry content, anyone who's a user of the LDKB can leave a comment. Um, you just have to sign up with an email and make an account. So all this to say that the LDKB is very adaptive and community involvement here is very important. So I've given a very brief overview of everything in the LDKB, but if you're interested in learning more, I really highly encourage you to visit the site yourself and poke around a bit, maybe read some of the about section that goes more in depth than I have. Um, this is a project that was started years ago and it has experts from many fields involved, but it's still a work in progress because many entries are not fully complete. And that's why I really encourage anyone who's interested to participate and maybe you can become a curator or reviewer too and maybe write an entry. So on that note, I want to shift my focus over to my specific project this summer, which was writing a full entry for the LDKB, again on sulfur mineralogy, meaning I wrote a full background section and at least four arguments that each had at least one piece of associated evidence. 
And this was a topic I chose just personally due to my previous research experience with Europa, which we have in the background here too. And that's an icy ocean moon orbiting Jupiter, which as we all know, has great potential for life and biosignatures. So to start, I wanna give a very brief overview of sulfur minerals. So typically sulfur atoms will be in this cyclic formation, which is this little ring of eight atoms. And then this can end up forming into a couple of different allotropes, which are just different physical forms of this element. So we could get rhombic crystals, which are more common since they're actually stable at room temperature and most of Earth's surface temperatures. And the most prevalent form of this one is called alpha sulfur. On the other hand, you could also get these monoclinic forms, which are these needle-shaped crystals. And these are much more rare since they're only stable between about 96 and 120 degrees Celsius. So typically you'd find these around volcanoes. Um, there's a couple forms of these. So we have beta sulfur and then gamma sulfur, which is also known as rosichiite. And these two will actually end up converting into alpha sulfur below that 96 degrees Celsius threshold, which is again, why they are so rare. But this is actually a really good thing in terms of biosignatures because it means that if we see these two forms somewhere outside of their temperature range and they're stable, that means that potentially there's something interesting going on. So moving on to my arguments, I want to summarize both sides, starting with biotic. The main takeaway here is that rosichiite and beta sulfur, when found in a stable form in a non-volcanic environment, are either direct or indirect products of microbial activity. So meaning if you find them in these conditions, it's likely that you're going to find life there too. Some evidence that's in support of this, stable rosichiite was found in a low temperature environment, this glacial place called Fort Fjord Pass. Um, and it was concluded that it was likely due to an abundance of these extracellular polymeric substances that are secreted by microbes there. It was also found in stable form in Death Valley, which was concluded was likely due to the microbes there actively influencing the geochemical conditions. So influencing things like pH levels and water abundance and such that the rosichiite could remain stable. And then finally, there were some lab experiments done where sulfides were reacted with these biologically produced organic carbon compounds, such as yeast extract pictured here. And that ended up producing both rosichiite and beta sulfur that were stable at room temperature. So all of this is not only great evidence in favor of these being potential biosignatures in the right conditions, but also in favor of their stability, since again, they're not normally stable in these conditions. So to the abiotic side, the main takeaway here is that it can be argued that beta sulfur and rosichiite, when they're found in a stable form in non-volcanic environments, are actually due to abiotically produced organic carbon compounds. So here there is no microbial activity involved directly or indirectly. And some evidence in support of this, well, some of the same lab experiments from the previous slide found that reacting sulfides with abiotically produced organic carbon compounds like glucose here, produced both beta sulfur and rosichiite that were stable at room temperature. So following that, it also stands that abiotic production of these forms could be very widespread across a lot of environments. However, since it competes with the biotic production, it might only be prevalent where the rate of abiotic production equals or exceeds the rate of the biotic production. But regardless, this still just shows that you should be careful to distinguish what's causing the presence of these mineral forms. So in conclusion, just from my one entry, we can see that there's a lot of potential biotic and abiotic factors, and also that there's a lot of considerations that go into determining if what you have is a true biosignature or a false positive. And this also really neatly shows the importance of the LDKB, because it's a resource that gets, um, you can concisely see all sides to these biosignatures, and then you also know what to look out for and what to be cautious of if you want to determine whether it's true biosignature or false positive. So I'll throw up this URL again to remind you where you can go to see all of this and also ask you, please join the LDKB if you're interested. And my entry, if you want to read it, will probably be live on the site sometime after August 31st. Um, I will also make sure to post this link um, and my mentor's email who's the engagement lead in the chat after my talk so that you can easily find it. So with that, I'm gonna close out with some acknowledgements and a nice picture here of our YSP meeting um, back in June. So thank you to Andro and Svet for being amazing mentors. Um, thank you to Graham Lau for lending me some of your expertise on sulfur mineralogy. 
Um, and thank you to the BMSIS Young Scientist Program because I learned so much this past summer and I'm really excited to be visiting a scholar starting in the fall. And thank you all for listening. Very awesome job, Adriana. A lot of claps going on over here from participants. So if you have questions, you can ask in the chat or you can raise your hand as a participant and I can call on people. Um, Sanjoy, just before I call on you, um, so Adriana, you know, it's, it's interesting for me as a scientist, you know, I was the first person to find beta sulfur at this place in the Arctic. And when you find something like that, it's like, oh my gosh, this is cool. It's a biosignature. I'll find it on Europa. It's a sign of life. I've done it. I'm an astrobiologist. I win. I guess I can find a different career now. But then what really was, was hard for me was the discovery from my end and, and working with Julie Cosmetis is that this could be an abiotic signature. And I, I think you did a really good job in your talk pointing out that, that what, we, what we presented in the research is very much that it could be both. It could be abiotic or, 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 or biological. Um, and I, I just, I'd like to hear your thoughts then about that. Do you think that's gonna be the case for a lot of our entries in the knowledge base that we're gonna have a lot of examples where there are arguments from the same paper even that are both for and against something being a sign of life? Yeah, I definitely think that that's the case. Um, I, I mean, even from this one entry, I really kind of uh, was surprised by how something so like specific could have like so many considerations on both sides. Um, but yeah, I think that's like the case in a lot of places. And it's it's the responsible thing to do just to like be really sure that when you're declaring that something's a biosignature, it really needs to be like, we know that this is a biosignature for sure. So yeah, I think that that's going to be the case for a lot of the entries probably, um, especially, yeah, this one, my project specifically was actually focused on um, adding in some abiotic knowledge. So that's why I kind of like dug so deep into the papers, I think was looking for that abiotic side. Awesome, thank you. I think I'll call on Sanjoy first and then Benji after that. Benji, go for it first. If there's time, I'll go. Yeah, so um, great talk. Um, so I'm wondering, have you considered expanding the knowledge base to include not just biosignatures, but technosignatures as well? Yeah, so I actually, um, because this is kind of like my first time dealing with the knowledge base and I'm not in charge, but I will be a curator um, starting when I'm a visiting scholar. Um, I think technosignatures is definitely something that could be added in. Um, I don't know how though, like how, everyone who works on this knowledge base would want to do that. I don't know if it would be something that would be like maybe specific topics underneath um, each of the categories we already have. Let me actually go back to that slide if I can. I'm gonna bring this up just to kind of show like, let's see. So when we have, I think this part, yeah. So I don't know if that would be kind of a category on its own or if it would maybe be a topic under certain categories. Um, but yeah, I would actually be very interested to see that added in too. Yeah. I think there's a lot of potential for it. Yeah, um, that's something I personally would be interested in volunteering my time to. So um, if there's any potential for that, let me know. Yeah, absolutely. I will post... Um, the link to the LDKB so you can look at it and also my um, mentor's email because she's engagement lead and she could get you probably into the meetings if you would like to be like a collaborator. Yeah, yeah that'd be awesome. 